Now let me introduce the three lectures which we have this month uh, with uh, a little inconsequential story and consequently you don't have to be terribly attentive. Uh, namely that uh, when I wrote my last published book, maybe it's not going to be the last, but you know, when you, you get to be my age, then everything you do appears, oh, maybe this will be the last, uh, uh, in any event, uh, Gnosticism. Uh, and uh, um, there is a chapter there, and it, it's listed on the flyer, which uh, uh, has, as in 40, some uh, specific definitions of uh, various features of the Gnostic tradition. The reason for that being that we found out uh, uh, by researching the literature that there was uh, not only no agreement, uh, but uh, very little uh, uh, accurate description of the various features and teachings and insights of the Gnostic tradition uh, anywhere. And we thought, well, if there isn't any, then we should supply it. And so it is now, to some extent, on those definitions that I came up with there, that the, the concentrated uh, uh, account of uh, the Gnostic worldview, what in German we call the, call the Weltanschauung, you know, is based. So uh, occasionally I will I may look in the pages of my uh, working copy. You can see that's a working copy of my book Gnosticism because it's all beat up as one is when one works. Uh, so in any event, that's the story why these topics, which are somewhat abbreviated here, are now uh, shared with you. Uh, and uh, that being the case, let's see what else do we, I think that's pretty much what, what we have. All right. This is the, the, October, uh, the October flyer, by the way, you will find it over there. You will also find some copies of my book Gnosticism and my other books there. And because of this uh, curious publicity that I have just put forth, the, the Gnosticism book will be uh, uh, on sale at discount. Now with that we proceed to our uh, topic, which of course uh, has to do with what is maybe the most portentous, although seldom uh, adequately answered uh, question of any worldview. And that could be probably summarized uh, as follows. Where do I come from? And from there you go on, where does everybody come from? And then uh, you look around and you say, where do the animals, where do the trees, where do all the various uh, living and non-living objects in our surroundings come from? And uh, when that question is asked, it is my uh, humble opinion that it is seldom answered in a manner which uh, is truly uh, creative. I don't, I didn't use the word informative for a purpose because you can inform people and not really receive a uh, response, particularly a desirable response of a creative nature. Because uh, in many ways uh, that is perhaps why uh, while we are here on earth that we can uh, we can look for and occasionally find what has been called meaning and the finding of meaning is creativity when you find meaning uh, you have become creative 
at least to that extent. But from that discovery flow a great many other valuable and portentous discoveries. Now, uh, that being the case, you have now some little knowledge as to why we are uh, occupying ourselves with this subject, and we'll see whether our uh, explanations and our message will get through to you. I am uh, <clears throat> my aged uh, uh, throat also is not as strong as it used to be, so if you can't hear me too well, then I don't know, jump up and down, make various magical gestures in the, in the air or curious noises to uh, get my attention. Now, uh, so by the way, uh, the, uh, the passage that we are talking about, which has all of these individual sentences, is, uh, uh, are the pages 187, 189 in my book, uh, Gnosticism. Now, uh, what we need to uh, keep in mind is that uh, right, rightly or wrongfully uh, or approximating the truth or shooting way beyond the truth, just about every uh, tradition that has some claim to spirituality or religiosity or something along that sort has possesses a, a uh, creation myth, as it is called. Namely, uh, people have come up with uh, a mythic structure, uh, a story, which is of course one definition of a myth, uh, trying to explain uh, the uh, uh, data concerning uh, the coming into existence of this reality within which we live and ourselves within it. So uh, creation myths, there are many. Uh, but, as you know, in the eyes of many people, I am not one, but uh, uh, many people in the media and places like that, a myth and the term myth is equivalent to an untruth. I remember the late and great Joseph Campbell, whom I also revered greatly, along with Ray Bradbury, who told this story that he was um, about to give, I think, a radio interview. That was more popular way back years ago uh, than television. And that uh, uh, before the interviewer started uh, talking to him or asking him questions, he said, well, Mr. Campbell, uh, why... Uh, are you so interested in myth? Everybody knows that a myth is a lie. So Joseph Campbell said, well, how can I retort to something like that? What can I say about that? So this is, of course, a fairly common uh, misunderstanding. And you find it in, uh, in newspapers, magazines, and things like that. Oh, that's a myth about something when they're trying to dismiss the subject. And that, of course, is very unfortunate. Now, I am recalling the words of a very learned man who was very, um, very good to us and uh, very influential in uh, our uh, Gnostic work, the late Dutch professor Hilles Quisper. Uh, from the University of Utrecht in, in Holland. And uh, uh, Quisper said at one time that Gnosis and consequently Gnosticism always originates in experience. Mm. But he says, owing to the uh, content of the experience, the experience is usually eventually turned into a myth. 
And the myth, uh, the reason for turning it in the myth being that uh, uh, there are certain subjects which are exceedingly difficult and perhaps even impossible to uh, put forth, to expostulate, uh, except in mythic form. Uh, and of course, this, this uh, form of communication has also been uh, quite uh, uh, frequently used uh, in ancient times and in, even in various cultures at the present time. I know that uh, uh, my father, who uh, uh, has traveled in the Middle East as well as various other uh, European countries, used to say that when you ask particularly a really serious, really uh, uh, portentous question to somebody in the Middle East, then the likelihood is that they will think for a while and say, well, let me tell you a story. Because they will answer your question with a story. Now, no doubt this requires a certain kind of mind on your part, because you have to know how to turn the story into the kind of uh, intellectual meaning that you expect, right? But it is very, very uh, valuable. And it's not only in the Middle East. I think you find it in India, you find it in China, you find it in Japan, in innumerable places. And I think the reason for it being, or at least one reason I can think of is, that uh, the, it's a, the myth is a psychological key to realities to recognitions, to insights that otherwise would not be available to us. There are certain uh, uh, insights about life uh, which cannot be communicated, at least not effectively communicated, in any other way. And therefore, a good many of the uh, statements that I intend to make tonight will also have a relationship to mythic structures, to mythologems, wherein they have been uh, taught and written about uh, in the past. Uh, but uh, and so it's, a, it's a great blessing, I have found it a great blessing, to be able to uh, approach mythic reality in such a way that we find it an opening to really deeper, truly satisfactory, truly uh, disclosive insights. Because they are there. That's why the myth has been designed. And if we find it there, then the process has been completed. Now then, uh, that being the case, uh, we'll look at some of the uh, insights of that sort, which have been largely mythically communicated to us, but which certainly have a, a great uh, importance and great value. Uh, now we know, of course, that in the cultural matrix wherein we live, there are, even though they are certainly not being uh, observed very much, studied very much and certainly believed very much, but there are creation myths that for a very long time have tried to account for this kind of reality wherein we live and of which we are a part. Uh, we have the Old Testament creation myth, uh, which uh, is in the book of Genesis, uh, wherein the uh, the creative agency uh, is the monotheistic God uh, who appeared in Judaism, yod He vav He. We have uh, the uh, creation myth of Islam, which is uh, could be particularly uh, um, off-putting to some, although I have great respect for much of Islam, because uh, 
the Quran says that Allah, who is of course the God, the law, you know, Al is the Arabic uh, uh, prefix, Al, law, his name was law. So it's the D law. And you know what else that you don't know, and probably many Muslims would not want you to know, is that there also was a feminine deity called Allah. And you can find it in the Hadith and in some of the Quran, wherein uh, the Prophet Muhammad thunders against Allah. You are not to believe in her, she's a woman. You know, but Allah is the one to believe in. Well, not that this is terribly important, but uh, I, am a, I like to be a source of uh, recondite and often useless information. <laughs> and, and, and that's why you are, that's why you are here. Uh, uh, now, so all, uh, all manner of uh, traditions, monotheistic, polytheistic, what other theistic there may be, have creation myths. Uh, and uh, the Islam, actually they brought up Islam because uh, uh, the Prophet says in the, in the Quran that Allah created man out of clots of blood. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, that is not very uh, uh, appetizing to a lot of people. Although we Hungarians are fond of blood sausage, mm. if we can get it, uh, and so forth, <laughs> you know. But uh, let us say uh, it is nevertheless true. It is an interesting statement, and there is possibly a, a hidden meaning of it. Because, well, we might as well try to throw it in now, then we can pick it up later. And what is the hidden meaning? The hidden meaning would be that as that cultural hero whose time is now coming at the end of October, my illustrious friend and relative Count Dracula, Count Dracula says to one of his disciples, to Renfield, the blood is the life, Mr. Renfield. Uh, and he has a good Transylvanian Hungarian accent when saying so, uh, you know. Uh, so uh, in any event, uh, uh, so the prophet uses the term which is commonly used to symbolize life, namely the blood, as being at the origin of uh, the human, in this case of the human being. And maybe we'll return to that theme in a slightly different context shortly. Uh, so uh, uh, what we really have is the, uh, the, uh, the creation myths that are trying to bring forth, sometimes successfully, sometimes not so successfully, trying to bring forth in some fashion that uh, the temporary reality within which we live uh, and of which we partake, because that is why the All Souls Day, the Festival of the Dead, is coming up in a lot of country. Alasalen, as we call it in German, uh, that uh, the... Uh, the uh, the temporary reality does appear to be grounded in and originating in a, an ultimate reality. And this is something that the creation myths of the world, in, with various uh, little changes, but all seem to have in common. You are temporal. You come and you go. You're born and you die. Yeah. But there, there are some things in reality which are a different reality. They are an, an abiding reality, an ultimate reality, a spiritual reality, whatever you wish to call it. And that, that reality, it would seem, 
is the origin and the end, the conclusion of the temporary reality. So when the temporary reality goes away, then it would seem that its, uh, its essence goes back to an ultimate reality. And uh, that is uh, why the uh, recreation myths all seem to uh, postulate in some fashion or in order one or more uh, creative beings. Beings who uh, in some fashion were responsible for bringing forth the, uh, the uh, reality which is the temporary reality. Uh, I think that uh, from time to time, and uh, certainly in our book club, which you may become, be interested in, we just started a, what we call a little book club on the fourth Thursday of every month, where we, at least at the present time, the book that we are dealing with to a large extent is Madame Blavatsky's Secret Doctrine. So uh, let's say uh, uh, there we find in a very poetic uh, uh, way uh, expressed the idea of uh, a, uh, a, uh, an ultimate reality uh, coming forth and beginning to manifest step by step increasingly as a temporary reality. I don't, I, I don't have the uh, five books plus index of, the, of my edition that I have of the Secret Doctrine with me, so I can only recall from memory the really beautiful uh, a poetic statement upon which, uh, at least in a spiritual sense, the entire books are based, wherein it is said, the eternal parent wrapped in her ever-invisible robes, had slumbered once again for seven eternities. And then the eternal parent wakes up, and then manifestation begins. So uh, once again, you know, a myth, a story, a, a poetic account. But that's about the, uh, really the best way uh, to try to bring these forth primarily because by reading them or reciting them or whatever you may do, uh, something, it may be a creation myth, you know, something is created within you. You can, you close your eyes and you see the eternal parent. You see some kind of a great slumbering being, you know, like the, some of these big statues that people built where somebody is lying down a uh, you know, very, very big uh, distance and uh, begins to wake up. So uh, let's say uh, all sorts of devices have been uh, designed in that fashion. Some of the uh, American Indians or Native Americans as now they are often called uh, being among the animal life a good deal of the time of their lives, of course, came up with things that there was a there was a primordial turtle that created the world. Now, just how the cur turtle accomplished that, I really don't know. But I would say it was a very smart turtle uh, to bring all of this weirdness uh, together. So, uh, you know the. Interestingly enough, uh, there are uh, creation myths, some of them originating in cultures really a very long distance from us here and uh, not much explored for a long, long time, like the Japanese. Uh, the Shinto creation myth has uh, similarities with the book of Genesis. There is an Adam and an Eve, but their name is Izanagi and Izanami. And they are the first humans. And from them came the entire human race. 
Uh, so, uh, you know, there are all kinds of uh, variations. But let us say uh, uh, some uh, are, I think, more uh, instructive and more reality revealing uh, than probably others. Now, uh, uh, what we uh, need to remember is that uh, the creation myths have a great deal of uh, influence uh, on cultures and on civilizations. Uh, and uh, when we hear such or read such words, whether we believe them or not, or whether we attribute much influence to them, as the words attributed to the monotheistic God in uh, Genesis, I am the only God, and there is no other God beside me. Uh, <coughs> it's not really my favorite words in the Bible, and it was not of the Gnostics either. But let us say it is a, a, it is a model for a very authoritarian uh, attitude, shall we say. Uh, now, uh, the pagan gods, as they have been called, you know, paganus just really means somebody who lives, uh, lives in the woods, lives in the forest, because the, at a certain historical time, uh, the cities, you know, the cities are always the first ones to change anything. You bring in a new political ideology, you bring in anything weird and new, the cities go for it. New political party, probably a lot worse than the ones that were there before, but it's new, haha, -ha, you know. Uh, so uh, uh, the cities are the ones that come up with the new stuff, then it takes them a while to find out that the new stuff wasn't even all that new and certainly wasn't all that good, but they do come up with it. So uh, in any event, we have something a little bit like that here. Uh, so uh, uh, what we also need to keep in mind that the, uh, the creative, uh, after all we are talking about creation myths, the creation, uh, the agents of creation, more or singular, depending on whether you are dealing with a polytheistic or a monotheistic uh, matrix, that these uh, agents uh, then, uh, well, how should we put it? Their image is in a sort of a magical way impressed on the culture. And so uh, the most monotheistic cultures at the present time, Judaism and Islam, although we should include the Zoroastrianism as well, the ancient Persian religion, which however no longer exists in Persia. You know, the stuff that exists in Persia today you'd rather not want to hear about. Uh, but let us say, uh, uh, the, uh, so uh, the Persians left, well, the Zoroastrian Persians, followers of the great prophet Zarathustra, for the most part, if they lived, lived through the, the Muslim invasion, they moved to India, where they are known as the Parsis, which just means Persian. And uh, believe it or not, uh, uh, the Parsis, for the most part, are one of the most uh, uh, prosperous nationalities or castes in India. Uh, why is that so? Just because they don't have any castes. And so if you are a Parsi, uh, uh, you can do, you can work at whatever you want to work at. You know, you don't have to go with your caste that your caste tells you that you have to make, I don't know, wheels for wa wagons and nothing else. And you commit a grave sin if you don't make those wheels. Uh, so uh, uh, the Parsis had the freedom 
to work in all kinds of trades and professions. Consequently, they became quite a prosperous uh, uh, minority in India. Why I bring all this up, I'm not so sure, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> but, uh, but let's say, uh, um, uh, so, uh, the, but the, the creation myth and the mythology of a people impresses itself on the culture and on the people. Uh, now, and that is, uh, there is where one of my little theories comes in, that the uh, religions which uh, follow the monotheistic model, especially directly or indirectly the model of the one who said, I am the only God and there are no other God, gods beside me, have certain features in common. And uh, I dare say uh, that uh, many of those features are uh, not very favorable. Not the kind of things that uh, you would be very uh, happy with. Now the ancient pagans, once again those people who lived in, the, in, in nature then for a certain time off and were called Paganus, had, beginning with the Greeks, everything starts with the Greeks. You know. uh, I usually have a Greek gentleman here, and when I say that, I can see the big smile come on his face, but now he's back in visiting in Greece, so I hope he's smiling there. <laughs> but in any event, Plato, who was of course the Greek of all Greeks, and uh, was incredibly revered for a tremendously long time. He hardly even in the Middle Ages, particularly at the time of the Renaissance, nobody spoke of Plato by not adding the prefix, the divine Plato, you know, very greatly. Now, Plato spoke in the Republic, if I'm not mistaken, uh, of uh, uh, a number of forms of government. These are the governments that people can form. And they are as follows. Monarchy, uh, aristocracy, uh, democracy, and tyranny. Now he may have added another two or so, but I probably forgot. Uh, and uh, I think I have some freedom to do that. Uh, in any event, uh, so what do you think uh, were the, uh, the particular forms of government that Plato mentioned here that became the most uh, popular? Monarchy and tyranny. <coughs> so uh, uh, that is of considerable importance because Plato's Plato's monarchy was, uh, was really a rather Gnostic uh, construct because he said that at the apex of every organization there must be a, a single being, a single mind. But this single mind in turn uh, should be a wise one, should be a one that does not uh, abuse its power and that uh, uh, employs its own skill and wisdom in service of the people whom it rules. And that would be monarchy. Uh, the opposite of that, although having certain similarities, is, is tyranny, which is again a single leader, but without any regard for uh, the real needs of uh, subjects and often uh, guilty of a great deal of oppression and tyranny. And while, uh, at least to my regret, uh, monarchies have been decreasing over the last couple of centuries, my native country, Hungary, until 1920, 1922, had its own king. It had a king on ear, practically uninterruptedly since the year 1000, since St. Stephen 
assume the crown that Pope Sylvester II, the great magician Pope, sent him. So it's only then that it was done away with. And since then, uh, there was a, a Dummkopf, American Secretary of State, not very long ago, whom I will not mention, because who knows, uh, I may be put into a contemporary American concentration camp if it comes out. But this, when, when the American influence began to go after World War II and quite a bit later in Europe and in the Balkans, you know, there were quite a few monarchies there. Yugoslavia, Romania, uh, others. And this American uh, uh, um, Secretary of State said, we don't do kings. Oh yes, but you surely do tyrants. You surely do dictators, don't you? Oh, well, we don't do them, they just happen. Oh yeah, certainly, but if some of the things you didn't do, maybe they wouldn't have happened. Uh, well, now, you know, my, uh, my monarchic sentiments come out. But let us say, uh, uh, this is how uh, uh, the, uh, the forms of, uh, of people uh, governing each other uh, came about. So the, 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 the creation myths uh, had a great deal of influence on, even on the form of government of, uh, of people. Uh, so, uh, the, as I said, the, the pagan gods being polytheistic, their uh, example lent itself to, well, uh, such things as uh, democracy, which incidentally Plato didn't feel very, very happy about. Uh, Plato's, uh, Plato's uh, form of democracy that he wrote about is when the uh, lowest denominator of people, the least, uh, the least informed, the stupidest, the, and the, the ones that uh, are less ca least capable maybe of the populace, Begin to, run a con begin to run a country, begin to run a people. Now whether the divine Plato was right about that, I don't know. But what you got to remember is that the founders of the American Republic uh, were not uh, emulators of Plato. Uh, they were the emulators of the philosophers of the enlightenment of people like Rousseau and Montesquieu and d'Alembert and uh, uh, others who uh, used these terms and various concepts by then certainly in a different manner. But let us say uh, uh, we do need to remember that the God concept, uh, the, the concept that people for various reasons form in their minds about uh, uh, the superior power, let's call it at this point, uh, have a very great deal of influence on the psychology and consequently on the history of the people. And this uh, always needs to be uh, remembered. Uh, you know, uh, uh, all right, uh, that, that being uh, uh, known, we, uh, we need to keep in mind that uh, uh, the, uh, the mythic example for anything, uh, the mythic example for the leader of a religion, the mythic example for the leader of a country or of several countries, or maybe of an entire, entire culture, is of tremendous importance because it impresses itself um, into the very psyche of uh, the people and consequently will continue to uh, receive uh, expression. Uh, and uh, uh, 
By the way, uh, just so you don't accuse me of uh, wanting to revive, I don't know, the reign of Louis XIV, uh, let me say that uh, monarchy in the, this is just by way of an explanation, that monarchy in the, at least in the, in the Western world, throughout the Christian Middle Ages and so forth, was not a tyranny. Because the, even at the time when some very astute and very, uh, uh, very active uh, monarch uh, got on some important throne, there were always various uh, factors that mitigated the, the expression of power. For instance, in the Middle Ages, and you know, the Christian Middle Ages really lasted a long time. Uh, the way it went, you had a king. All right, uh, there, there he was. He he ran the local uh, kingdom. Then, uh, but the king in turn had a contact with a kind of a super king, who was who? The emperor, and the emperor was the not just an emperor, but the Holy Roman Emperor. And after Charlemagne, the Holy Roman Emperor of German nation, because we always chose to form the German. And he was the one to whom the kings and princes uh, appealed when they couldn't take care of the situation themselves. Now, what if the emperor himself uh, was, let's say, uh, a difficult guy? Uh, you know, what happened then? Well, they, op they could appeal yet to someone else. You would think that after that it would be only God. Uh, but no, they could appeal to the Pope. Mm. And the Popes called in the emperors like they did with Frederick, uh, one of the Fredericks to, the, to Canossa, made him walk in the snow. The, the Holy Roman Emperor made him walk in the circumambulate the castle wherein the Pope was, I don't know how many times, he froze his feet uh, because that was his punishment for having been too tyrannical. Uh, so, uh, and then of course beyond all of them, there was always the recognition of an ultimate, of a supreme power, not physical any longer, but spiritual, uh, of whom and of whose uh, character, let us say, these various uh, ruling uh, personages uh, were modeled. So you might say there was, uh, there was always a concept of the king of kings, of the, of the, the hierophant of hierophants, some ultimate authority. And this is important to remember in connection with our friends, uh, uh, the Gnostics. Uh, so uh, uh, now, of course, what about, I, I mean, I have to explain myself because otherwise I will be justly uh, accused of uh, a sort of uh, slanted history here and partisanship. Uh, now, what needs to be kept in mind is, among other things, that uh, the, uh, there was, at certain times in history, what came to be called an absolute monarchy. Uh, it slowly and laboriously and painfully developed in the Roman Empire when, after Julius Caesar, uh, had the descendants of Caesar, beginning with his nephew, Caesar Augustus, uh, uh, they, they were proclaimed uh, emperor. Rome never had um, emperors before that. Way, way back they had some kings, but they had forgotten those already. Uh, so, uh, uh, but let us say even there, uh, the Romans also, as like all the ancient peoples, uh, they, they did believe in, although they did not always manage to practice moderation. You know, it's an important thing. Uh, all things in moderation 
including moderation. Let that be at the maximum, maximum of your life. Be moderate moderately, and things are going to be all right. Uh, see. But let us see uh, uh, what, uh, what developed eventually uh, when the pagan room fell, that the, the, the concept of the imperator, which originally was a military title, you know. But anyway, the concept of the imperator was there, and it then became with Charlemagne, uh, uh, the Holy Roman, Holy Roman Empire. Now then, uh, that being the case, yet later on, in various historical times, we came up with uh, what came to be called absolutism, absolute monarchy. The, uh, the greatest uh, representative, and really the most brilliant representative of that, have been Louis Louis the Fourteenth of the House of Bourbon, you know, and now uh, that was the beginning of, of absolute monarchy. And the idea was let all the power be concentrated in the king or um, in the ruler, the emperor, and uh, really with very little restraint, so kings could do anything. Well. Uh, Let's put it this way, uh, you can see, uh, if you look a little bit at your history as to how long that lasted. Louis the 14th, yes, Louis the 15th, by the time of uh, the third generation, Louis the 16th, off with your head. Uh, then came the guillotine, so it never lasted long, not in the other countries either. Uh, but, you know, it, it was an idea that, that very largely, believe it or not, was championed, introduced, and uh, greatly uh, extolled, which I already mentioned, that championed by who? By the French philosophers of the Enlightenment, by Voltaire, by D'Alembert, by Diderot, by Montesquieu, by Rousseau, by these people. And why, why would these people, who, you know, after all, you know, they, they advocated freedom and everything, how come they would, uh, they would uh, let's say, advocate a delegation of absolute power uh, to a king? Well, the human mind is strange, uh, you know, and it comes up with all kinds of strange stuff. I'm sure that is a recognition that has come to you from time to time, especially when resorting to our, our newspapers and to our media in general. And so what, first of all, you, you got to, uh, I know that this is uh, still a little bit off the subject, but uh, I'll mention it anyway. Because you are captive, you know. We didn't lock the, the doors, but when you start filtering them out, we lock it. You know? uh, uh, so, anyway, you know, he's a joker. Uh, you know, to keep that in mind. But uh, what the situation in the Middle Ages was that there were innumerable petty rules. Barons, counts, knights, princes, dukes, grand dukes, you name them, all over the place. And then sort of their nominal uh, uh, head was a king. And his nominal head had internal emperor and so forth. So what, 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 what happened in France was that the kings, some of whom were very brilliant people, I mean Louis XIV was certainly one of the one of the most brilliant rulers who ever sat on a throne, and so were others. But why, uh, what, did they, uh, what did they recognize? They recognized that France was a great big country. By then, pretty much everybody spoke the same language in France, and so forth. And uh, that uh, uh, this, uh, this required a more centralized management. But 
that you couldn't go on in a, with a country with hundreds and probably thousands of beautiful chateaus, because and many of them are still there, the castles of the nobility, and each one inhabited by a sort of a little king. He said, you know, I run my own show. I don't give a hoot what they are doing in Paris. I am doing what I want to do here, and so forth. So uh, it became somewhat unmanageable. It would be as if every governor of these various states in the United States would declare uh, uh, independence. Uh, well, you saw what happened to some that declared independence during the, uh, the Civil War and so forth. They didn't do terribly well. But at that time, so Louis XIV said, no, nah, you know, we got, to, we got to do something else. And what he did was, what we got to do with all of these uh, lordlings is to entertain them. Entertainment will trump, I'm sorry to use that term, uh, you know, uh, will trump their, their desire for power. If they're, really, if they're really having fun, they are not going to mind if there is a king who is more powerful than they are. And that's why Versailles was built. That is why the absolute monarchy under Louis XIV was built. Because all the nobility from the countryside was now implored and uh, successfully to come to Versailles. And uh, King Louis saw to it that they would have a lot of fun. And you know what? They did. Uh, so uh, in this way, by way of uh, 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 mellifluous uh, uh, overlordship, Louis ran the country. And then he said, said look, uh, uh, Duc de Montmorency or somebody like that, you know, you have that great big castle, that chateau. You don't really need that. It's too big for you. So I. I tell you what, why don't you promise me that you're going to take, I don't know, take three towers off the chateau. And then it's not going to, of course that meant it's not going to resist me when my show soldiers will come along. And in this way, the whole chateau system, the chateau, the, 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 which was the survival of the medieval nobility was, uh, done away with. And of course the next doing away with was by the revolution. But you know, when you, when you change a country with a guillotine, and the results are not likely to be very nice. Uh, and uh, that needs to be kept in mind. But let us say, uh, this is how things changed. But the fact of the matter was that after two more kings, uh, it just didn't work, and that's why there came the French Revolution. Now, no, not to go into it, but if, unless you think now that I am riding some kind of histori historical hobby horse here, <laughs> and I will never get around to the Gnostics, uh, be assured. And, and where, the, where the Gnostics come in is that the, the Gnostic cosmology, the Gnostic wealth on showing, the cosmoconception, whatever you want to call it, is composed to some extent on the model of uh, the uh, divinity that is both unitary and multiple. In other words, the, the Gnostic uh, cosmology says that there is only, and we had a little bit about that in our book club, that there is only one reality. Ultimately, everything is one. But the one has to become the many instead of something to be happening. It's very understandable. If we just know with a abracadabra, with a big magic now, would unite all of you into one being here, 
First of all, it, we would be a very funny looking lot. Uh, but, uh, but secondly, uh, you, have, uh, you have done away with individuality. You have done, with, uh, uh, done away with personality. You just created one great big blob, blob of humanity. And uh, apparently the ultimate reality, the ultimate uh, deity did not wish to do that. And for this reason, when not by fiat, not by the, uh, the decree of uh, I am the only God and there is no other God above me, not, not by the decree of a tyrant creator, but by a very, uh, a very natural and interesting development, a, a, a flow of reality took place. In other words, there's an ultimate source from whence all life, and life is not such a good word, uh, so let's say all consciousness comes. And uh, then as it pours forth into manifestation, it uh, uh, becomes more manifold, there are more and more details, all kinds of uh, uh, personality uh, 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 differences and so forth. And it keeps pouring forth. I had a, um, an idea at one time, which like my best ideas was never realized, uh, and that uh, I, I could get somebody with architectural talents who would build a fountain and we could build that fountain either on a Gnostic model or maybe more briefly on the model of the Kabbalah. And there would be a water or a liquid coming out from the top of the fountain. And then there were like with the Kabbalah, there would be 10 vessels below. And from one vessel, uh, it would flow into the next one and from that one into the next one. And we'll see this, uh, we will see this flow of the original essence through its various vessels. I thought it would be very exciting. Nobody picked me up on my suggestion and it never got done. Uh, but, but let us say, uh, this is kind of the model, that there is indeed a, uh, an essence which appropriately, essentially, is one. It comes from the same source. It has, uh, it has uh, if not identical, but very similar qualities. You might say it is all the body of God, not of the monotheistic God of the Old Testament, but of the, of the ultimate reality of being. Now, that being the case, this causes, this is a very big and a very intricate process. It, if you, you know, the Kabbalah, uh, which is really as Gershon Scholem, one of the greatest uh, scholars of Jewish mysticism in modern times, uh, expressed it, is really Jewish Gnosticism. The, uh, the Kabbalah with its ten vessels is uh, the indication of how um, a real original essence, that's the best word, can come forth from a mysterious great source. Because you've got to remember, as Gershon Scholem certainly did, that the, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with these slightly technical things, but let's say the, the Kabbalah does not consist only of the tree of life. There is a reality beyond the tree of life. And it is called in Hebrew, Hebrew the Ein Sof Ur, the infinite light. And so originally from the infinite light, from that infinite mystery, comes the light that fills up the tree of life. Now, that being the case, the Gnostic uh, cosmology is very similar to that. At some point, because of its own nature, because of its own uh, uh, 
desire or whatever you wish to call it, uh, the, the eternal parent takes off her ever invisible robes and starts pouring forth her essence into a new reality. And this reality is reality. This is the reality of the Gnostics. No, but it's very, very manifold. It's much, much more complex and manifold than, say, the Tree of Life. In it there are thousands and thousands of, of individual beings, angels, archangels, uh, creative beings, uh, centers of wisdom, you name it, going on and on and on. And as it continues to flow, shall we say, eventually it becomes more and more dense. Uh, and I don't mean that in the pejorative sense, but it becomes, becomes less, less ethereal, less spiritual, less intellectual, less emotional, and eventually way down at the bottom it becomes material. And that, folks, is where we are. We, we, we do, we, fortunately though for us, we, we have carried with us, and so have many other beings, let's say uh, uh, some of the spiritual essence that we had or that we were in the beginning. We've never lost it, but it has diminished with our manifestation. Uh, and eventually we are down here in the material universe. Now I can see the little balloons coming up and over some of your heads. But uh, physics doesn't believe in matter anymore, it believes in energy. You know what? I couldn't care less. It's not relevant to the issue. You can call it energy, you can call it matter, you can call it whatever you want to. But let's say there are the, uh, the, most, uh, the most descended, the most coarse, the most uh, material uh, emanations, emaneo means to come forth, that have come forth from the original source. And all of this together, folks, adds up to reality. So there is a trans, completely transcendental spiritual reality, which is so real that it can't be any more real. And then there are, is a middle region which is a little bit less so. And eventually it's the material region which still has the essence within it, but let's say to a diminished degree and uh, with maybe more difficulties for its manifestation than otherwise would be the case. So um, what we are dealing here with is a, a Weltanschauung, a world picture of incredible diversity combined with an underlying unity. G great big contradiction in terms, but that is how it is expressed, and that is really how it manifests. So uh, what are we dealing with now? For instance, here we are, let's take a big jump, and here we are to this manifested world where we live with its earth and with its trees and with its dogs and cats and, and ourselves and so forth. And uh, uh, let's say it's full of uh, peculiar things. It's full of imperfection. It's full of uh, perversity and full of stupidity. Uh, and uh, not because uh, of willfulness, you know, people are stupid not because they want to be stupid. They are stupid because that's how they are made. And I'm sure you have encountered a few. Uh, but let us say, you know, we have a, a, a strange reality 
which is a, a mixture of spirit and matter. And if you don't like matter, call it energy. See if I care. Uh, you know. But let us say uh, it, it is a mixture of uh, energetic systems of many different kinds with many different functions and on many different levels. And when, uh, well, I don't know how, how, how to, uh, what would be a, a good way to express it, but let us say when uh, you find yourself in an altered, greatly altered state of consciousness, you find yourself in a trance of certain kinds, you find yourself in a, in a visionary state, and you see all, you see and experience all kinds of strange things there. You don't even have to go that far. Just uh, take a good sleeping pill or, or a nice glass of Jack Daniels and go to sleep. And you know what? If you are like me, you're going to have dreams that just won't quit. Uh, and that uh, are not unreal. I know that in the sort of the prosaic period of German literature, there was a term, Träume sind Schäume, which means dreams are so much form. Well, that particular German, like the brothers Grimm, who were very grim, uh, you know, he was, he was wrong. No, no, dreams are not just bubbles. Dreams have a powerful, portentous, lasting meaning, especially if you learn to understand them. Of course, that's always a problem, uh, but uh, yeah, they are. And so uh, uh, this is, the, this is the, the bigger picture. Now, now what I was leading up to, and maybe it's time about for me to quit, but I'm not going to do it yet, is the fact that uh, uh, when it comes to creation myth, you might say there are two creation myths in Gnosticism. The first one is the ultimate transcendental being, the fullness, pleroma in Greek as it is called. What is that? Because it is an essence that is full of possibilities, that is full of, uh, of uh, future developments, that is... Uh, uh, loaded with uh, ongoing and unfolding meaning. Right? But as the emanation goes on, as this, this mysterious manifold reality keeps descending farther away from the source, then other things set in. And then there come about uh, forms of consciousness, beings, whatever you would call them, who are uh, not as uh, wise or not as beneficent as some of the ones further up. Uh, and, uh, you know, a, a certain loss of uh, wisdom occurs. And these are what the Gnostics called archons, which means rulers, spirits that want to rule their segment of reality. And their chief, at least in relationship to our reality, is, uh, is the demiurgos, as it's called in Greek, and uh, demiurgos means half-maker. He, he is creative, but only up to a certain extent. And so, uh, let's say, there are forms of consciousness that uh, do, uh, do make things. But uh, uh, maybe, uh, maybe what they make doesn't turn out all that great. Or maybe what they make turns out in an antagonistic uh, relationship to something else that they made. And so they have created war and many other things. 
So, uh, uh, Yaldabaoth or the demiurg, the half maker, has been indicated at a certain time of the creative process as the, uh, well, the ruler of material creation uh, and is the one who to a very large extent uh, uh, organizes and reorganizes in a, an imperfect manner the kind of reality wherein we live. So here is now the, in this figure, and its associates, the archons, uh, may be found the uh, explanation for just about everything that we are complain about in this world. Why aren't things more just? Why aren't things more wise? Why aren't things more beautiful? My, why aren't things more fun? That's what I say, uh, at least at this, this moment. Why are all these desirable good things either absent or at least uh, submerged somehow, uh, taken away somehow in this world? So uh, this is a big question. Buddha had a simple way of putting it. He said, everything suffers. Everything that lives suffers. Hmm. And uh, what did he propose to do away with the suffering? Uh, build more computers? Uh, build, more, uh, build more rocket ships? No. What he proposed? Become enlightened or at least what that means in Buddhism. That kind of enlightenment, an experience of consciousness, which uh, mitigates against and ultimately is even able to do away with the injustice, the suffering, the pain, the misery, uh, the stupidity that reigns and runs rampant in this world, that can do that, to that, our spiritual ancestors gave the name Gnosis, because the Greek pronounces the G quite hardly. What does Gnosis mean? It means knowing. But as Elin Pagos very beautifully pointed out in her book, The Gnostic Gospels, it's not the knowledge of facts. Uh, for instance, it's, uh, it's not that uh, I know uh, mathematics, which I don't. I always, ha always hated, I still do. Uh, but uh, let's say uh, it, it means something like, I know you, which means that I have made some contact with you in consciousness, which is valuable and which can create a certain interchange. So it's, it's a knowing in consciousness. It's an awareness at a deeper level. This gift, this uh, ability, this kind of knowingness, I don't even want to call it at this point knowledge, this is the way out of m pain, of misery, of suffering, of all the things that the Buddha was uh, trying to undo, and no doubt in certain cases has undone. And it, it is what the, in the Christian version, let's say, has been called salvation. Now, once again, the time is going along with us uh, greatly, but I need to conclude in a little more conclusive manner, don't you think? I mean, if, if you want to conclude, it should be conclusive. <laughs> and the, the, the conclusive thing is that, uh, yes, buddy, you, you find yourself in a difficult situation. You find yourself in a place that at least part of the time is anything but pleasant. And I challenge anybody here or in Los Angeles or in California or in the world to contradict that. It's full of unpleasant experiences. 
Uh, and uh, however, these experiences should uh, impel us, if not compel us, to find a solution to the situation. Buddha, Gautama, uh, Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, were sitting under the, the great ancient fig tree, said, yes. And he didn't say it in these words. It's too trivial. He said, I got it. I got it. <laughs> there is an enlightenment. There is an awakening, which is another word for it. Actually, one of the official names for, for a Buddha has been the awakened one rather than the enlightened one, but that's, that's a detail. So uh, there is such a thing. And he feels while sitting under the tree and while Mara, the, the Lord of Illusion, uh, paraded in front of him for hours, his, uh, his crew, his troops, all the spirits, all the demons, all the, all the false angels, uh, to say, say, I, I am the guy who runs this world. I have all of these troops. And Buddha, Buddha just sat there. And then out of the, out of the greatest pleroma, out of the greatest of lights, came the light to him as to an enlightenment is possible, a gnosis is possible, a liberation is possible. But this liberation has to occur in our consciousness, and it can occur in our consciousness. And that, that's why, let's say, you know, the, the Buddhist argument is a very good one, because she says, well, how did the Gautama know that there is an enlightenment? How did he know? Because he experienced it, because he was enlightened, because he knew what it was all about, and then was able to facilitate that development in others. Now, uh, to, the Buddha, to, the, to the Gnostics have Buddhas? Well, they have Mara, the, uh, who would be the, the Buddhist demiurge, the deceiver, the one who wants to run things. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't do these things, but I will. Uh -huh. uh, so what I want, once I feel it, I don't know any longer at this point whether it was a dream or whether it was a vision, but I was confronted with at least two or three uh, very questionable characters in my dream. After all, the world is full of them. Why not have your dreams full of them too? And uh, uh, these, so I went up to one of them and said, hey, who, who are you? What, what, what are you doing here? You know, I, I sensed that they were unpleasant critters. And this, this face turned into something really, really ugly. And he said, we are the ones who run things. We are the ones who manage things. I said, well, buddy, you're not going to manage me. And I walked away. So that's the, that's, that is the Gnostic concept of archons. Because, you know, uh, every uh, spiritual tradition uh, has accounted in some fashion for evil, for bad things. Why? Because if they didn't, nobody would go to them. If Islam didn't have a shaitan, uh, or Iblis, the devil, and nobody would listen to her, have listened to the Prophet Muhammad. Well, he's leaving half of the, uh, the reality out of the picture. And that is why our culture is, is bound to fail if it goes on the way it is. Why? Not so much because we no longer recognize God. Well, okay, yeah. If you work on it hard enough, your consciousness will disclose an ultimate reality to you. Don't, don't worry. Uh, but if you don't recognize evil, it's going to get you. Sure as all hell get out, it is going to get you. No, 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 there is no evil in the world. 
I've got evil conquered by my computer. Oh yeah, oh yeah, there's something smiling there behind the computer. So, but, but you conquered nothing. You conquered nothing because you don't know. If you had gnosis, then you would know who I am and you would know uh, what else happens. But I don't want to leave you hanging with evil because that's a bad place to hang out. <clears throat> but let me give you something else. As this fantastic developments, and I, I wish I could convey to you even at a feeling level how incredibly huge and, ri and rich this development is. It is full of spirits, it is full of angels, it is full of human souls, it is full of suns and moons and stars and light and glory and some darkness. Uh, the further down you get, it is there, but it is there. And if you affinitize yourself to it and to what it wants you to do and primarily recognize your own affinity with it, because that is why, uh, let's say, uh, uh, St. Paul the Apostle, whom Elaine Pegels, the great monastic scholar, uh, wrote her very first book, I think it was her master's thesis, was the Gnostic Paul. She recognized him as a Gnostic. And that's where, that's where St. Paul wrote, among others, the Christ in you, the hope of glory. And with your hope of glory, you have something. Something is there. You don't recognize it. You run after other things, but something is there. If you took recourse to this resource, to this hidden wonder that is inside of you, you would be, you would have gnosis, you would be enlightened, you would be a, you would be a light in the world. Because as one of the Gnostic Gospels said, a man of light is full of light, he lights up the whole world. You could be one of those. And there the Gnosis informs us, there have, have been those. And there are those. And these are the messengers of light. And since uh, they had their, their biggest, uh, latest expression in the beginning of the Christian era, they, uh, uh, they identified Jesus Christ as such a messenger of light. And certainly the innumerable deeds and words of that mysterious prophetic uh, holy man can be and should be interpreted in that way. So we are in part under the dominion of the demiurge the half maker, which is, which is what it also means. If you want to change it into Latin, then it's the same <laughs> you know. Uh, yes, but uh, we are, but we don't have to remain there. We have within us the, the seed that will produce the, uh, the conquering plant, the sacred flower, that is able to put the Demiurgos back to his place, to uh, exorcise the, exercise the uh, imperfect and evil beings that run so much of this world as that, uh, that uh, vision told me, and then create a much better world. So if you want to, Number one, if you want to feel better. I would say if you want to feel better, don't worry too much about the medics. Now, I'm not an enemy of doctors. One of my best friends in, in this place who inducted me here to the, to, into the Theosophical Society in the 1950s, Dr. William Apt, may he, may he go gloriously in, in the other world, was a medical doctor and I knew many others. I know, I know some now, but don't, uh, as Buddha said, betake yourselves to no external means. You see? But be enlightened. Be enlightened. Yeah. And uh, because anything short of that, any medicine that is turned out by the 
the pharmaceutical companies who love these uh, epidemics so much. Look, look, if I owned one of them, I mean, how much money I would have made at that time. You know, it would, would be worse than epidemic. Uh, and all kinds of things like that. But uh, there is recourse. There is something that you can come through. There is a true architect of the universe, as we call him in certain types of associations, not the Demiurge, but another one, who, who, if you take recourse to that being, you will be one of those who will rebuild this universe in the image and likeness of something great, of something wonderful. So, but what is to be done? What is to be done? I see the question going up in the little balloons above your heads, like in the cartoons. What, what is to be done? What is to be done is to recognize that the solution is not out there. That an extroverted solution is a false solution. That a mechanical uh, solution is a false solution. It is not out there, it is in here. Now there can be external means, initiations, sacraments, uh, various ways of uh, establishing and maintaining contact with the deeper, deeper worlds that can help. But that's all they can do is help. The, the means, the seed of enlightenment the power, the glory is inside of us. And if we realize that, but I mean we re truly realize it by making it real and avail ourselves of effective and lasting means of pursuing that, then to use a, a Judeo-Christian expression, which probably Jesus Christ used at one time, the gates of hell will not prevail against you. He said it in the New Testament. The gates, of hell, the gates of hell will not prevail against you. Because you stand on that kind of a gnosis. You are, you are not just, it wasn't just as somebody told you. It wasn't just somebody that, read, that you read in the book. It wasn't just something that you saw on the computer screen but it's something that you have come to know. And if there is anything at this time in the uh, late and possibly last period of my life that I can assure, assure you that this is possible. You can defeat the demiurge, you can defeat the darkness, you can defeat the archons, and you can defeat them by a potency, by an ability, by a treasure that is already within you, but which has to, which needs attending to. If instead of it you attend to all kinds of, well, this is what is happening. Every human being in this world, and maybe some animals too, has within himself or herself a an incredible, powerful treasure. Something that may be likened to a, 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 a spiritual nuclear device with incredible, incredible power. All we have to do is get close to it. All we have to do is, is cultivate it. All we have to do is, is develop it, and if we do so, the rewards that we receive will be beyond measure, will be beyond measure. And not only to, for ourselves, but for others. Why? Do you know anybody in this world who doesn't need enlightenment, who doesn't need gnosis? I don't know any, including myself. You know, no. So, if you cultivate gnosis, if you have gnosis within you, if you are able to perceive the, the ability for that gnosis in others and communicate them, 
then you have really saved the world. Then you have really done something to others. Anybody can give somebody food, which I don't mean that we shouldn't give food to the hungry. Anybody can do physical things to people, but only those who have come close to this incredible source of transformative, informative, salvific force can do the other. Until such people increase, until such people are active within their salvific mission. This world remains as it is. It will remain as it has been for thousands and hundreds of thousands of years. A place of pain, a place of misery, a place of sorrow, a place of poverty, a place of uh, unbelievable disappointments. But that can change. It can change like that. And you know who can change it? You can change it. How? Right now, start thinking about it. Start moving your consciousness in that direction. S start calling in a humble and accepting way upon that incredible liberating reality that is within you. And if you have called long enough and loud enough and sincerely enough, it will come and it will redeem you and with you it will redeem the world. Thank you very much.